Canadian law is confusing, complicated, filled with political jargon and boring. You know, back in my old day, I just made all the rules and everything was fine and dandy. Fine and dandy, I say. Wait, 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 wait. Where are you going with this? It's, that's the wrong introduction. No, I'm just telling them the truth. No, you're not. Let me do it. <laughs> People have no respect for kings these days. <laughs> Canadian law is extremely interesting and exciting. And to help you understand it better, this video will give you a brief guide to Canadian law. In order to explain how Canadian law works, we need to understand why we need laws in our country. A country's laws protect its citizens from each other and even their own government. Defining right from wrong may be obvious and simple in some instances, but not so much upon closer inspection. To ensure that every citizen can live in peace, a country needs good laws. Laws have been around for a long, 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 long time. The Code of Hammurabi is a collection of some of the earliest laws that are on record. These laws were carved into stone. One such stone can be seen in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Hammurabi wanted the rules for his civilization to be accessible for all. He had all 282 laws and the consequences of breaking them carved into stone. The next detailed set of laws came quite a while later with the Mosaic Law. This law was given to the Israelites while they wandered in the desert. This law was detailed, and many of the punishments were far harsher than what we would see in our legal system today. Sometime between 527 and 564 BCE, Emperor Justinian codified the Roman law. An important aspect of these laws was the idea of equity, which means being fair and impartial. It was shortly after this time that Greek law was written. Greek law focused largely on having procedures in the law process. Closer to the roots of our modern Canadian law is the Magna Carta. This law originated in England during the 1200s. It took some of the power away from kings and gave more to the people. It challenged the idea of the divine right of kings. Common law also originated around this time. Common law, also known as case law, is not codified, but based on past decisions which are known as precedents. This law started because England had a feudalism system, so the king ruled the whole country and the country was divided into smaller areas with lesser rulers. So that all the verdicts for various crimes across the country were the same, they developed the common law system. All provinces except for Quebec use the common law system. Quebec's system is largely based on the Napoleonic Code. Also known as the French Civil Code, this law was focused on equity and justice for all. Civil law follows a set of rules for making decisions, rather than past decisions. Canada's law is still evolving and changing today. Canadian law is affected by what Canadians want to see in their law, but also international law, like the laws the United Nations make. The basis for all Canadian law is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. On April 17, 1982, the Canadian Charter came into force. All other Canadian laws had to be revised after this point in order that they would comply with the Charter. The Charter lists the rights and freedoms of Canadian citizens as the name suggests. It places particular emphasis on how all Canadians have equal rights which they are free to exercise without fear of prosecution. The government made the Charter extremely difficult to amend, so that no one could compromise the freedoms Canadians deserve. There is one exception, called the Notwithstanding Clause, which the government made so that provincial governments could be exempted from certain charter laws as long as the law had nothing to do with democratic, mobility, or language rights. Canadian law is split into branches. The first branch is substantive law, which lists the rights, duties, and obligations of each person within Canadian society. The other branch is procedural law. This is the process of law and outlines the steps involved in protecting the rights given under substantive law. It explains how police, court systems, and the government are meant to work. Substantive law is further split into public law and private or civil law. Public law always has the government involved and is further broken down into criminal law, which covers crimes against society, constitutional law, which defines the governmental structure, and administrative law, which manages the relationships between the citizens and the government. On the other hand, private law outlines the legal relationships between citizens or citizens and private organizations. It is subdivided into family law, which involves individuals who live together, contract law, which governs the requirements for legally binding agreements, tort law, which outlines wrongs one person commits against another, 
property law, which governs the use, enjoyment, and rental of property, and finally, labor law, which deals with relationships among employees and employers. The next important thing to mention is actus reus and mens rea, because, of course, law loves to have its fancy Latin terms. Mens rea is the knowledge or intention to commit a crime, not the actual act. The act or conduct or state of being of committing a crime is actus reus. Basically, mens rea is the mentality of committing a crime and the guilty mind, while actus reus is the action of committing it. In order for a person to be convicted, the Crown needs to prove that both of these were present. For example, if a person accidentally forgets to pay for something at a store, they have only committed the act of stealing. If they then return the item or pay for it, that proves that they did not mean to take the item. In contrast, if they decide to keep the item knowing they stole it, then they also have the aspect of a guilty mind. There are three categories of criminal offenses in Canada. They are summary offenses, indictable offenses, and hybrid offenses. Summary offenses are minor criminal offenses and most often result in a fine, but sometimes result in up to two years in prison. A summary offense could be creating a public disturbance or driving another person's car without their permission. Indictable offenses are far more serious criminal offenses and usually result in imprisonment. Imprisonment can last anywhere from a two-year sentence to life imprisonment. Examples of indictable offenses include murder, theft over $5,000, and arson. Hybrid offenses are like a mix between the two. In this case, the Crown Prosecutor gets to decide whether the case is to be treated like a summary offense or an indictable offense. Depending on the Crown Prosecutor's decision, the trial will be held a certain way. A hybrid offense could be forced entry, theft or fraud under $5,000, and concealed weapon. The responsibility of the Canadian criminal court system is divided between the provincial and territorial governments and the federal government has to write and formulate the system as well as establish various courts. The lowest level is the provincial courts. In these courts, summary offenses and indictable offenses are heard. Superior courts of the province, as the name suggests, are the highest courts in a province. They handle both civil and criminal matters. Most of the time, both a judge and a jury are used during a trial. The federal court system consists of the Federal Court of Canada and the Supreme Court of Canada. The Federal Court of Canada manages the cases which involve the government, and there is a trial and appeal decision. The Supreme Court of Canada is the highest of all appeal courts in Canada. An appeal is a request that a higher court reviews the decision of a lower court. This is the furthest an appeal can go, since there is no higher court than the Supreme Court in Canada. During a trial, a judge or jury listens to the evidence and decides whether the accused is guilty. Once a verdict has been reached, the judge decides upon the sentence. Juries are only used for very serious offenses like murder. Juries are made up of 12 Canadian citizens. Any Canadian citizen can be called for jury duty, and they have the duty to attend. When a criminal trial is called, the Crown Prosecutor, representing the government, presents the case against the accused. They bring forth witnesses and evidence in order to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused did indeed commit the offense. The accused, or the accused lawyer, will cross-examine the Crown's witnesses. They bring witnesses and evidence in the attempt to find fault with the evidence presented by the Crown. Following the cross-examination, the accused or their lawyer presents their case. Now, it is the Crown Prosecutor's turn to cross-examine the accused witnesses. Finally, both sides summarize their positions. They cannot present any new evidence at this time. After the judge or jury deliberate, they make their decision based on the facts presented. If the judge or jury decide that the accused is not guilty of the crime, then they are free to go without any penalty. In contrast, if the accused is found guilty, then the accused will be convicted and receive their sentence. In Canada, there is the Youth Criminal Justice Act, which specifically applies to people between the ages of 12 and 18. Prior to this act being passed, there were concerns and issues with the incarceration rate of young offenders, unfairness of sentencing, and lack of an effective process of rehabilitation and reintegration into the community. This act tries to keep young people out of jail and prevent crime among youth. It also takes into consideration that youth are not quite as mature as adults and may have acted on peer pressure, impulse, or ignorance of the consequences. When a judge is sentencing a guilty youth, they base their decision on previous youth cases. A youth sentence should never be more severe than it would be for an adult in the same situation. Furthermore, when a youth is convicted, their name cannot be published. This is done to protect the youth and make it easier for him or her to return to their community. 
This video has covered why we need law, the history of law, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the different types of law, actus reus and mens rea, types of offences, the Canadian court system, trial procedures, and what happens to young offenders. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a lot.